Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon Sunday School, where you're going to learn about things you'll never hear about in regular Sunday school. Welcome to class, everybody. We're in the Come Follow Me manual. The course of study is the Book of Mormon, and we are in 2 Nephi, specifically 2 Nephi chapters 6 through 10. Now, this passage is a sermon in the Book of Mormon, but it's not a sermon by Nephi. It's a sermon by Jacob. Wait a second, you say. Don't we have to wait till the book of Jacob to read about what Jacob has to tell us? No, we don't. Because even though the book of Jacob comes at the end of 2 Nephi, Jacob gets to preach a sermon that is contained in 2 Nephi, and it's 2 Nephi 6 through 10. This sermon has a very interesting structure, and we're going to dive deep into the structure and a textual analysis of this sermon in today's show. And what we find out is very interesting. First off, the structure of the sermon. Second Nephi 6, 1 through 4. This is an introduction that Jacob gives. It leads into Isaiah quotes by Jacob saying that they may be likened unto the Nephites. Isaiah spoke to the house of Israel. Nephites are broken off of the house of Israel. Therefore, you can take what Isaiah said and apply it to the Nephites. That's Jacob's theory. Then Jacob quotes two verses from Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 22 through 23. Then Jacob expounds on these Isaiah verses in like a mini sermon. And then he leads into quoting two chapters of Isaiah. Actually, it's a little bit more than two chapters. He quotes two chapters of Isaiah. And then in 2 Nephi 9 and 10, the last two chapters of this sermon, Jacob expounds on these Isaiah chapters that he has just quoted. So Jacob quotes a little bit of Isaiah, does a little sermon, quotes a lot of Isaiah, and then does a big sermon. That's the basic structure here. Now, of course, there are problems with Jacob quoting Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. The Isaiah that Jacob quotes is directly from the King James Version Bible. I mean, it's word for word from the King James Version Bible, which did not exist, of course, until 1611. And on top of that, it just happens to be the Bible that Joseph Smith's family had and used. It's the Bible pretty much everybody had and used at the time in Joseph Smith's day and neighborhood. And number two, even if we grant that Jacob is quoting from the brass plates, how is it that it ends up replicating exactly, in most places, the King James Version? It could have a similar meaning, but word-for-word -word quotations in a translation make no sense without a King James Version for Jacob to have quoted. Also, an additional problem is that these quotations are from 2nd Isaiah or Deutero-Isaiah. Jacob is quoting from basically from Isaiah 50 and 51, a little bit before and a little bit after, but mainly that's it, Isaiah 50 and 51. Bible scholars tend to agree that this section of Isaiah was not written until after the Jews had returned from their captivity in Babylon. In other words, it wasn't really written by Isaiah. It was written by students of Isaiah, fans of Isaiah, replicating Isaiah, attributing it to Isaiah, but writing it long after Isaiah lived. Second Isaiah is chapters 40 through 66 of the book of Isaiah, which comes from the school of Isaiah's disciples, can be divided into two periods. Chapters 40 through 55, generally called Deutero-Isaiah, were written about three, 538 BCE, 538 BCE, after the experience of the exile. And chapters 56 through 66, sometimes called Trito-Isaiah or Third Isaiah, were written after the return of the exiles to Jerusalem after 538 BCE, and that article is from the Britannica website. So you can see that if Jacob is quoting chapters 50 and 51 of Isaiah, that falls squarely within Deutero-Isaiah, written around 538 BCE. This raises the problem of how Jacob could quote Isaiah from the brass plates when these chapters are part of Deutero-Isaiah and they weren't even written until around 60 years after Lehi left Jerusalem. And therefore, these chapters of Isaiah 
would not have been on the brass plates for Jacob to quote in the first place, much less in King James Version English. So if we're going to treat Jacob's sermon as a text. We've got these problems that we've already identified. It's the KJV language, and it's also from Deutero Isaiah. There's no way that this should be in the Book of Mormon and not in the language that it is in the Book of Mormon, the, K, the King James language. But we're going to set those problems aside now and focus on the text. In other words, we want to see what Jacob, and I'll put that in quotation marks, what Jacob is saying and why it is he's quoting Isaiah to say it. As it turns out, Jacob's use of Isaiah is intrinsically tied to his sermon. Jacob does not just drop a couple of chapters of Isaiah and then go on to talk about something unrelated. In other words, the Isaiah quotations are not just filler material, at least not these two chapters of Isaiah quoted by Jacob. Now, some of you who've been following the show may say, wait a second, isn't that a contradiction? Didn't you say in an earlier show that the Isaiah chapters could be viewed as simply filler material? You may think I'm contradicting myself at this point, saying these Isaiah chapters are not filler material. Well, one of my favorite quotes from Walt Whitman comes into play here. Do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. So we'll be looking at this from a different perspective today. And it is pretty clear when we do a close textual analysis that the Isaiah chapters for Jacob are not filler material. So once again, back to the basic structure of Jacob's sermon, Jacob quotes a little Isaiah, then he preaches a little, then Jacob quotes a lot of Isaiah, and then Jacob preaches a lot. That's as basic as I can make it. So why does Jacob quote Isaiah? Second Nephi 6, 5 says, and now the words which I shall read are they which Isaiah spake concerning all the house of Israel. Wherefore, they may be likened unto you. Nephi gets quoted a lot about likening the scriptures unto ourselves. It looks like this idea first shows up in Jacob's sermon. They may be likened unto you, for ye are of the house of Israel. And there are many things which have been spoken by Isaiah, which may be likened unto you, because ye are of the house of Israel. So that's why Jacob quotes Isaiah, at least why he says he's quoting Isaiah. So here's where Jacob, Jacob quotes a little Isaiah. It's just two verses. It's in 2 Nephi 6, 6 and 7. And now these are the words. That leads into his quote from Isaiah. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their faces towards the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet. Mmm, yummy. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. This is a restoration passage. These verses from Isaiah involve the Jews returning to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity, which is one of the reasons that most scholars agree that it was written around 538 BCE. The Neo-Babylonian Empire conquered Judah, destroyed the temple and Jerusalem, and took many inhabitants captive into Babylon. And that was around 587 BCE. But of course, Lehi and his family were long since gone from Jerusalem with the brass plates before that date, before uh, the Neo-Babylonian Empire destroyed Jerusalem. The Neo-Babylonian Empire was in turn conquered by the Medes and the Persians, who then permitted the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the temple. And once again, that was around 537 or 538 BCE. These are the kings and queens who will restore the Jews to their homeland. Jacob now does a little preaching. Jacob knows the Babylonians have destroyed Jerusalem by revelation, he says, and correctly applies this Isaiah passage to the return of Jews to Jerusalem. 2 Nephi 6, 8. And now I, Jacob, would speak somewhat concerning these words. For behold, the Lord has shown me that those who were at Jerusalem from whence we came have been slain and carried away captives. Nevertheless, the Lord has shown unto me that they should return again. That is the exact interpretation of this passage from Isaiah. And that's what it means. 
and Jacob gets it. But then Jacob does something interesting with that. He extends the prophecy to the last days, 2 Nephi 6.10. And after they have hardened their hearts and stiffened their necks against the Holy One of Israel, behold, the judgments of the Holy One of Israel shall come upon them. And the day cometh that they shall be smitten and afflicted. Wherefore, after they are driven to and fro, for thus saith the angel, many shall be afflicted in the flesh and shall not be suffered to perish because of the prayers of the faithful. This is last days now. They shall be scattered and smitten and hated. Nevertheless, the Lord will be merciful unto them, that when they shall come to the knowledge of their Redeemer, they shall be gathered together again to the lands of their inheritance. Notice how Jacob links the Jews converting to Christianity, essentially, coming to a knowledge of their Redeemer, and that being linked to their being gathered the second time to return to the lands of their inheritance. Jacob incorporates Isaiah's language. So we can see that not only is he correctly interpreting what Isaiah said, the part that he quoted, but he's going to incorporate Isaiah's language in his sermon to make it clear the link that he's making and why it is he's quoting Isaiah. Again, not just filler material. 2 Nephi 6.13 Wherefore, they that fight against Zion and the covenant people of the Lord shall lick up the dust of their feet. Remember that phrase? And the people of the Lord shall not be ashamed. For the people of the Lord are they who wait for him, for they still wait for the coming of the Messiah. We can put this together side by side and see how in 2 Nephi 6, 7, when Jacob is quoting Isaiah, and 2 Nephi 6, 13, where he's preaching his mini-sermon, how he incorporates the language of Isaiah in his mini-sermon, including the phrase, lick up the dust of thy feet, and they shall not be ashamed, and that wait for me. All of those are still in here, in his sermon. They shall lick up the dust of their feet. The people of the Lord shall not be ashamed, for they who wait for him, for they still wait for the coming of the Messiah. So it's very clear that he's doing an interpretation of Isaiah that he's quoted here. And Jacob concludes his mini sermon. He says, and behold, according to the words of the prophet, the Messiah will set himself again the second time to recover them. Note, the first time they were recovered was after the Babylonian exile. The second time they will be recovered is after the Roman dispersion in 70 AD, when the Romans came and did for them what the Babylonians had done 600 or 700 years before. It goes on in verse 14, though. Wherefore, he will manifest himself unto them in power and great glory unto the destruction of their enemies. When that day cometh, when they shall believe in him, and none will he destroy that believe in him. So there Jacob concludes his mini sermon. <clears throat> and now Jacob repeats the same pattern, except on a bigger scale. He's going to quote a little more than two full chapters of Isaiah from just before chapter 50 of Isaiah to just after chapter 51. And here's the key. These chapters that he quotes now, are also restoration chapters, just like the two verses he quoted initially. Jacob now takes this idea of restoration of the Jews to their promised land after the Babylonian captivity. He's already extended it to the Jews being restored to the promised land in the last days once they begin to believe in the Savior. But he's going to use this idea of restoration now and apply it to a number of different subjects. The first one, uh, the next first one, is the restoration, he applies it to the true church of God. He says in 2 Nephi 9, 2, that he has spoken unto the Jews by the mouth of his holy prophets, even from the beginning down, from generation to generation, until the time comes that they shall be restored to the true church and fold of God, when they shall be gathered home to the lands of their inheritance and shall be established in all their lands of promise. So the Jews are not being just restored to the land of their promise in the last days, but they're being restored. And that's Jacob's word that's significant. They shall be restored to the true church or the correct belief about God, which is, of course, Christianity. Here, the restoration of the Jews to their homeland after the Babylonian captivity gets applied to the Jews in the last days, that they will be restored not only to their land, but also to the true church and fold of God. Then Jacob applies restoration to the resurrection. Verse 6, 
For as death hath passed upon all men, to fulfill the merciful plan of the great Creator, there must needs be a power of resurrection, and the resurrection must needs come unto man by reason of the fall. And the fall came by reason of transgression, and because man became fallen, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. So, and then in verse 12, and this death of which I have spoken, which is the spiritual death, remember he's talking about restoration, shall deliver up its dead, which spiritual death is hell. Wherefore, death and hell must deliver up their dead, and hell must deliver up its captive spirits, and the grave must deliver up its cap captive bodies. Why? And the bodies and the spirits of men will be restored. There's that word again Jacob's using. One to the other. That's the resurrection. And it is by the power of the resurrection of the Holy One of Israel. So here Jacob applies this concept of restoration, and he's elaborating it to include the resurrection as well. Then Jacob applies restoration to the judgment. Verse 15, And it shall come to pass that when all men shall have passed from this first death unto life, insomuch as they have become immortal, so they're resurrected now, they must appear before the judgment seat of the Holy One of Israel. And then cometh the judgment. Do -do -do and then must they be judged according to the holy judgment of God. Well, you say, well, how is this a restoration? He answers that in verse 26. For the atonement satisfieth the demands of his justice upon all those who have not the law given to them, that they are delivered from that awful monster death and hell and the devil and the lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. And now we get to it again in the last sentence. And they are, what? Restored to that God who gave them breath, which is the Holy One of Israel. And then Jacob applies the restoration to his posterity as well. Remember, he's likening Isaiah unto the Nephites. Second Nephi chapter 10, verse 7. But behold, thus saith the Lord God, when the day cometh that they shall believe in me that I am Christ, then have I covenanted with their fathers that they shall be restored in the flesh upon the earth unto the lands of their inheritance. And it shall come to pass that they shall be gathered in from their long dispersion from the isles of the sea. So it's not just the, the Jews going to Jerusalem. It's also those who are upon the isles of the sea. And Jacob sees his people as being upon an isle of the sea. And therefore, this passage having special application to him and his people. And from the four parts of the earth. And the nations of the Gentiles shall be great in the eyes of me, saith God, in carrying them forth to the lands of their inheritance. <clears throat> and once again, that's harking back to Isaiah and the kings and the queens. Verse 22 now. For behold, the Lord God has led away from time to time from the house of Israel according to his will and pleasure. And now behold, the Lord remembereth all them who have been broken off. Wherefore, he remembereth us also. Now, Jacob incorporates Isaiah into his sermon. Let me go back here and let's recap, okay? Because this is really pretty impressive. The passage that Isaiah, or excuse me, that Jacob quotes deals with Jews returning to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. He then applies that to the Jews in the last days being restored to his, to the promised land. He then applies it to the Jews being restored, not only to their promised land, but also to the true church in the last days. He then applies it to uh, a restoration being the resurrection and the joining together of the body and the spirit that are separated at death. He applies it to the judgment where he says, they are restored to that God who gave them breath, which is the Holy One of Israel to be judged. And then he applies that idea of restoration to his own posterity. Okay, so he's actually creating a very detailed, a very structured, a very well thought out sermon when we look at it closely. Now, Jacob incorporates Isaiah into his sermon. This is the first example. Once again, 2 Nephi 6, 7, when he quoted those two verses about the kings and the nursing mothers. And in 2 Nephi 10, 9, he says, Yea, the kings of the Gentiles shall be nursing fathers unto them, and their queens shall become nursing mothers. Wherefore, the promises of the Lord are great unto the Gentiles, for he hath spoken it, and who can dispute? So we see that Jacob now, he's quoted Isaiah, he's going to do his sermon, and it's linking to Isaiah and concepts in Isaiah. But not just the concept of restoration, he's actually 
using language and phrases from these quoted Isaiah sections in his sermon to show that the, the connection between the two. <clears throat> Here's the second example of Jacob incorporating Isaiah into a sermon. Second Nephi 8, 5. This is Isaiah being quoted. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and mine arm shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Second Nephi 10, 21. This is Jacob sermonizing. But great are the promises of the Lord unto them who are upon the isles of the sea. Wherefore, as it says isles, there must needs be, be more than this, and they are inhabited also by our brethren. So there's the second example. The third example of Jacob incorporating Isaiah's language into his sermon is 2 Nephi 8.10, once again, quoting Isaiah. Art thou not he who hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the, trans, for the ransomed to pass over? And in 2 Nephi chapter 10, verse 20b, that means the second half of the verse, nevertheless, we have been driven out of the land of our inheritance, but we have been led to a better land, for the Lord has made the sea our path, and we are upon an isle of the sea. So we see that in a number of instances, three here, that Jacob uses the language of Isaiah that he has just quoted in his sermon in order to show that he is giving a prophetic interpretation of the Isaiah passages that he has just quoted. Okay, now we get to a record scratch moment because not only does Jacob <laughs> incorporate Isaiah into his sermon, he unfortunately incorporates Paul the Apostle into his sermon. Because 2 Nephi 9.39 says, Remember to be carnally minded is death and to be spiritually minded is life eternal. If that sounds familiar at all, it's because it's almost a direct borrowing from Romans chapter 8, verse 6, where Paul writes, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So the only difference is, is that life eternal has been changed to life and peace. Everything else is word for word the same, as in the King James Version. Of course, that's a problem. Even if Deutero-Isaiah were not a problem in the King James Version, in Jacob's sermon, this is definitely a problem because Romans is not going to be written until about 600 years after Jacob lived. Now, there's a strange verse here in his sermon. And it. let's start off by noting that Nephi mentions his brothers, Jacob and Joseph, being ordained priests and teachers in the chapter immediately leading up to chapter 6, Jacob's sermon. In 2 Nephi 5.26, he writes, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, did consecrate Jacob and Joseph that they should be priests and teachers over the land of my people. And now we get to 2 Nephi 6, verse 1, the very first verse of the reading assignment for today. This is what it says. The words of Jacob, the brother of Nephi, which he spake unto the people of Nephi. That's what I think is a strange verse. It kind of jumped out at me as I was reading the material in preparation for today's lesson. Because the question it raises to me is, <clears throat> and why I think it's strange, is who wrote this verse in 2 Nephi chapter 6, verse 1? Is it Nephi? Why would Nephi speak of himself in the third person? This is a first-person record from the beginning all the way to the end of 2 Nephi. And the first person who's writing is Nephi, with the exception of this sermon by Jacob. So is it Jacob writing this first Verse, the words of Jacob, the brother of Nephi, which he spake unto the people of Nephi. Is it Jacob? Again, why would Jacob speak of himself in the third person? The first inclination might be to guess, well, it's Mormon, because Mormon makes all sorts of editorial comments throughout the Book of Mormon record. The problem is it could not have been Mormon, because Mormon did not edit or abridge the small plates of Nephi. There should be no commentary from Mormon in the small plates then. Now remember, Mormon tells us this in the words of Mormon. And in fact, the words of Mormon is pretty much devoted to explaining to us why it is that there's a duplicate record that goes from the beginning of the record from Nephi and Lehi in Jerusalem all the way up to King Messiah. And he's explaining that he found, he Mormon, 
while he had abridged the large plates of Nephi that cover that time period, that he somehow knew, because God told him there was going to be a problem with those. They're going to get lost, actually. So God tells him he needs to duplicate the record for that time so that when Joseph Smith goes back to translate again, he can translate the small plates of Nephi, which haven't been already translated and then lost, i.e. the 116 pages. And he can cover the same time period. Here's what Words of Mormon 1, 3, and 6 say. And now I, this is Mormon, I speak somewhat concerning that which I have written for after I had made an abridgment from the plates of Nephi down to the reign of this King Benjamin of whom Amalekai spake. I searched among the records which had been delivered into my hands and I found these plates which contained this small account of the prophets from Jacob down to the reign of this King Benjamin and also many of the words of Nephi. Now King Benjamin, of course, begins the book of Mosiah. But behold, in verse 6, he says, but behold, I shall take these plates which contain these prophesyings and revelations and put them with the remainder of my record for they are choice unto me and I know they will be choice unto my brethren. So Mormon does not abridge the small plates of Nephi, i.e. the record that we have from 1 Nephi chapter 1 all the way up to the beginning of Mosiah in the current book of Mormon. Which brings us back to the question, who wrote the introductory verse to Jacob's sermon? Once again, the words of Jacob, the brother of Nephi, which he spake unto the people of Nephi. We know that Joseph Smith translated Mosiah through Moroni before going back to translate the small plates of Nephi, covering first Nephi through the beginning of Mosiah. Remember, that's the Mosiah priority theory. We've talked about that in a prior class. We know also that there are many examples of Mormon the abridger making commentary from Mosiah through Moroni. It's all over the place. So the question then is, is it possible that 2 Nephi chapter 6, verse 1 is a slip by Joseph Smith, forgetting there is no abridger of this section and putting in a comment that more appropriately would belong in the abridged section? So when I talk about doing a deep dive into the text of this sermon, I'm not kidding around. But it is an interesting question, isn't it? I don't know that it's dispositive one way or another, but it's like one of these things doesn't belong there. Now, here's an interesting thing. Isaiah makes reference to these two sons, or at least I should say that Jacob quoting Isaiah makes reference to these two sons. And so this is 2 Nephi 8, 18 through 20, quoting from Isaiah, chapter 50, no, chapter 51, I believe it would be. And none to guide her among all the sons she hath brought forth speaking of Israel in um, symbolic terms, personified terms, neither that taketh her by the hand of all the sons she hath brought up. So she's got nobody to guide her, nobody to lead her, but it talks about sons, right? Twice in that verse. Then verse 19, these two sons are come unto thee who shall be sorry for thee. So out of all of them, there's two who will feel, feel sorry for their mother, Israel. Thy desolation and destruction and the famine and the sword. That's why they're going to be sorry for her because she's been subjected to all that crap. And by whom shall I comfort thee? Thy sons have fainted, save these two. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of thy God. Now, Isaiah 51, chapters 19 through 20 Interestingly, when it talks about the two sons, it doesn't use the word sons. It uses the word things. So what Isaiah says that's being quoted by Jacob is these two things are come unto thee. Who shall be sorry for thee, etc. Nephi, or excuse me, Jacob in 2 Nephi quotes it a little differently. And he quotes it as these two sons, not things, these two sons are come unto thee, who shall be sorry for thee. So who are these two sons in Jacob's mind? King James Version Isaiah doesn't have to answer that question because it has these two things instead of these two sons. Why does the Book of Mormon change things to sons here? Or why does Jacob change things to sons when he's quoting Isaiah? Is it possible 
I ask, that Jacob saw a reference to himself and his brother Nephi in this passage. The only two sons of Lehi that we have a record of preaching repentance unto the people. Second Nephi 6, 5, and there are many things, remember, there are many things which have been spoken by Isaiah which may be likened unto you because ye are the house of Israel. And my question is, is Jacob in his mind likening this passage about the two sons and he changes it to two sons to himself and Nephi? Are they the two sons that he sees Isaiah as prophesying about? Now, he doesn't follow up on it. He doesn't uh, make that connection, but it's a possibility. And I think it's an interesting possibility. And it's made a little bit more interesting and perhaps more plausible by the fact that Jacob goes out of his way to change the word things to the word sons. Oh, here we have the classic passage also of anti-Semitism in the Book of Mormon. 2 Nephi 10, verse 3. Wherefore, as I said unto you, it must needs be expedient that Christ, for in the last night the angel spake unto me that this should be his name. Strange, he never mentions the, um, the actual appearance of the angel. That's not in the record. We don't have a story about that. We just have Jacob talking, mentioning that the name of this person will be Christ, and then saying, oh, I know that because the angel who appeared to me last night, that's what he told me. That's the first time we hear about any angel. And it's pretty much the last time we hear about any angel appearing to him the night before. It will be interesting because when King Benjamin does give his speech, I think he does a very similar thing. And we'll point it out when we get there. He talks about an angel who appeared to him the night before that we don't have a record of, but he told him stuff that he incorporates into his sermon. So it must needs be expedient that Christ should come among the Jews, among those who are the more wicked part of the world. And they shall crucify him, for thus it behooveth our God. And there is none other nation on earth that would crucify their God. So the Jews are not only among the more wicked part of the world, which is anti-Semitic enough, but they're the only people that are wicked enough that they would crucify their God. So this is a classic case of anti-Semitism as it developed in Christianity over time. And they were called God killers and Christ killers, because they crucified Jesus. That's what Christians would call them in the Middle Ages and at other times. And it looks like Jacob is picking up on that thread as well, that thread of anti-Semitism, and we find it in the Book of Mormon. So the Book of Mormon isn't objectionable just because it talks about a curse of God being placed upon the Lamanites and that curse being, or the sign of the curse being the black skin. It's also got a very virulently anti-Semitic passage in it as well. And that's this passage, 2 Nephi chapter 10, verse 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, Isaiah also includes a quote that references Rahab. Now, the title of this episode is The Monster in the Book of Mormon. I forgot to introduce the title at the beginning, but it's on the thumbnail. The Monster in the Book of Mormon. It's not clickbait because we actually have a monster in the Book of Mormon. And it occurs first in this passage from Isaiah, where he refers to Ahab, not Ahab, Rahab. It's 2 Nephi 8, verses 9 and 10, where he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 51. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days. Art thou not he that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? That's a parallelism, by the way. Cutting Rahab and wounding the dragon is saying the same thing in different words. Rahab is the dragon. Art thou not he who hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea away for the ransomed to pass over? A likely reference to, in that verse, um, the children of Israel being led out of Egypt by Moses. And he parts the Red Sea and they go through. But the second Nephi 8, 9, ancient days, God cutting Rahab and wounding the dragon. What the heck does that mean? Who or what is Rahab? And I looked around to do, um, I know what the answer is, but I was looking for a good article that would do a good job of explaining it. I looked at a number of them. I found a good one. It's at a website called BioLogos. It's by Pete Enns, E-N-N-S. And he posted it on February 2nd, 2010. I'm going to read this article, and I want to make sure I give proper attribution. 
It's titled Yahweh Creation and the Cosmic Battle. Oh, and there's a picture. There's the cosmic battle between God and Rahab, the monster, the dragon. So who or what is Rahab? This is going to keep the same title, I think, throughout. But here comes this article. What is the biblical view of creation? We typically, we typically look to Genesis 1 and 2 to answer this question. But other Old Testament passages have something to say about this too. Israel's understanding of creation shows how indebted they were to current notions in the ancient world, i.e. they borrowed their mythology from others, including the Babylonians and possibly the Canaanites. One of the ways the Old Testament describes creation is through a conflict between Yahweh and the sea or waters or one of the sea monsters, Leviathan or Rahab. The sea is a symbol of chaos. And so Yahweh's victory in the conflict establishes order. He is the creator, the supreme power. Israel's proper response is awe and praise. The Israelites were not alone in thinking this way. The cosmic battle motif is prominent in other creation texts from the ancient Near East. For example, in the famous Babylonian creation story, Enuma Elish, the god Marduk defeats the goddess Tiamat, who represents the sea. He, Marduk, then cuts her carcass in half and makes sky and earth from the pieces. Thus, he becomes head god of the Babylonians, which results in praise and homage. homage. Likewise, in another creation story, the Canaanite god, Baal, defeats the sea god, Yam. And Hebrew Yam means sea, with similar results. So the Jewish people borrowed their primordial creation story from these other uh, cultures. But later, they created their own creation story. In fact, two of them, and we find them in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. There's two creation stories there. But neither of them are this story. And yet, we find remnants and references throughout the Old Testament to this primordial creation story that probably predates either creation story in Genesis 1 or 2. Interesting, huh? And this passage in Isaiah is one of those places in the Old Testament where we get a reference to it. The Israelites clearly connected with this way of describing creation. Some examples are the following. Here's some of those passages I told you about. Psalm 104.7, at your rebuke, the waters fled. This is not talking about low tide at the beach. Without raising a hand, the waters scampered away from Yahweh and were defeated. Psalm 89, verses 9 through 10, Yahweh rules over the surging sea, or yam, and crushed Rahab. We have Rahab's name again there in that psalm. Job chapter 9, verse 13, the cohorts of Rahab cowered at Yahweh's feet. Psalm 74, 13 through 14, Yahweh split open the sea, or the yam, broke the heads of the monster in the waters, and crush the heads of Leviathan. Rahab and Leviathan can sometimes be seen as different sea monsters or different names for the same primordial sea monster of chaos. And finally, Psalm 77, 16, when the waters saw God coming, they went into a panic. They writhed and convulsed. And there's a picture depicting Yahweh and the cosmic battle with Rahab, who represents the sea and is sometimes then for, therefore represented as a sea monster. It is clear that Israel's understanding of creation included a cosmic battle where Yahweh is victorious over the sea. But some are not convinced because Psalms and Job are just poetry. I read other articles like that as well. Poetry tends to use colorful metaphors and images. So some claim that Psalms or Job don't tell us what Israel really thought about creation. Sure, some Psalms talk about Leviathan and Rahab and the sea going into a panic attack, but that is just poetry. If you want the straight scoop, go to Genesis 1 through 3. No cosmic battle there, just sober history. 
That's the way this author characterizes those who contest that these references to Rahab are merely figurative and poetic and don't represent how the ancient Israelites really saw their creation. He goes on, it's not quite as neat as that. First, wholly apart from the cosmic battle motif, Genesis 1 through 3 has problems of its own for literalists. There, too, Israel's stories indisputably bear the marks of ancient Near Eastern influence. But leaving that larger issue to the side, the cosmic battle motif is very much in the background of Genesis 1, even if it is muted. God splits the water in two in verses 6 through 7, and so separates the waters above and below. In verse 9, he divides the waters below to form the land. Also in chapter 1, verse 2 of Genesis, God hovers over the deep, which is tehom in Hebrew, and is similar to the word tiamat in Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation story myth. In fact, Genesis chapter 1, verse 21, even mentions that God created the great sea monsters, another Hebrew word, taninim, taken from Canaanite mythology. But as he says, it's in the background in Genesis chapter 1, but you can still see elements of it there. So in Genesis 1, instead of God fighting this pre-existing and self-existing apparently, because God doesn't create Tiamat in this ancient cosmic battle, he just battles Tiamat and defeats him, therefore, thereby establishing order over chaos. In Genesis, that's been modified so that God creates the sea monsters. He is above them. He is their creator, not their um, the person who battles against them. And there's another picture as well of the same thing. And there you see Yahweh with the sword coming down to uh, take on Tiamat. Tiamat, the sea, the sea monster. There is no actual battle in Genesis 1. The deep and the waters are not gods, but inanimate objects. That's how it's been modified. The sea monsters are not foes, but created by God. But that does not mean that Genesis 1 escapes the cultural influence, as we saw above. Rather, scholars understand the cosmic battle to be muted in Genesis 1 to emphasize God's unquestioned supremacy. Second, poetry is not some lesser form of literature that tolerates nonsense. The Israelites did not think, well, it's just poetry, so we can say some wacky things we would never dare say in the narrative. The opposite is the case. The Psalms were used in worship. The presence of the cosmic battle motif in Psalms actually tells us how important this notion was to them for praising the Lord. He is worthy of praise in part because of the defeat of his ancient foes. That is how the Israelites understood it. <clears throat> Third, excuse me. Third, the cosmic battle motif is not just in poetic texts. For example, Ezekiel's prophecies against Egypt use this motif. Pharaoh will fare no better than the ancient sea monster, according to Ezekiel 29, 3 through 5, and 32, 2 through 8. There is a lot of other creation imagery in these passages. Likewise, the entire Exodus narrative, and this is really interesting to me, the entire Exodus narrative is one big cosmic battle scene, something Isaiah brings out as well, which is what we just quoted. In fact, if you look at the context, of the last two psalms cited above, 74 and 77, you will see cosmic battle language describing the splitting of the Red Sea. Deliverance from Egypt was another cosmic battle victory for Yahweh. He conquered the waters of the Red Sea and split them open. Remember what Yahweh does to Tiamut in the creation battle myth? Kills him or her, or her kills the monster, splits it in half, and creates heaven or the sky and the earth. That's in the Babylonian version of the same myth. This motif gets a lot of mileage in the Old Testament. The cosmic battle motif is just one angle from which to glimpse the biblical view 
of creation. I do not believe that the cosmos was created by Yahweh beating up the sea or slicing up sea monsters, nor should anyone else. But this is how the Israelites talked about creation in a number of places. When it comes to the science slash faith discussion, the presence of the cosmic battle motif in the Old Testament should send us a strong signal. Don't expect the Old Testament to inform, let alone guide, the scientific investigation of origins or the creation. If we approach the Old Testament expecting from it a literal, historical, accurate account of creation, we will one, misrepresent reality in the name of faith, and two, miss the theology that the biblical authors were so intent on putting there. Wasn't that a great article? I really appreciated that. I thought that was very well written. Now we get to the monster in the Book of Mormon. We have seen how Jacob takes elements of the Isaiah passages he quotes and incorporates them throughout his sermon. We saw that with the, the two verses of Isaiah he quoted and then his mini sermon, and we saw it even more with the two chapters of Isaiah he quotes and then his longer sermon. So the question that I raise now is, does Jacob do anything similar with this passage about Rahab? Jacob makes re reference to a monster in his sermon. Rahab was a monster, a sea monster. This monster is described not as a sea monster in Jacob, but as death and hell. Jacob appears to be the only Book of Mormon author who describes death and hell as a monster. Jacob makes use of the term monster three times in his sermon after quoting this passage from Isaiah about Rahab. And these are the three passages. The first one is 2 Nephi 9.10, where he says, Oh, how great the goodness of our God who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster. Yea, that monster death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. Is Jacob using that passage from Isaiah about Rahab, and now using it to personify this monster Rahab, not as the monster defeated by Yahweh at the beginning of the world, but as the monster death and hell that the Messiah must defeat in order for us to be resurrected and judged by our works. The second passage is 2 Nephi 9, 19. They're all in 2 Nephi 9. O oh, the greatness of the mercy of our God, the Holy One of Israel, for he delivereth his saints from that awful monster, the devil, he adds the devil here, and death and hell. And now he adds, and that lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. And the third passage where he references the monster is chapter 9, verse 26. For the atonement satisfieth the demands of his justice upon all those who have not the law given to them, that they are delivered from that awful monster death and hell and the devil and the lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. And they are restored to that God who gave them breath, which is the Holy One of Israel. So there's those three verses where Jacob refers to death and hell as this awful monster. In two of the three references to the monster, Jacob mentions a lake, usually a body of water we think of with a, but when you use the term lake. Though in this instance, it is a lake of fire and brimstone. Also in two of the three references to the monster, Jacob equates it not only to death and hell, but also to the devil. And I, I mentioned this again in a, another slide about the devil. In two of the three references to the monster, Jacob equates it not only to death and hell, but also to the devil. So question, is Jacob intentionally riffing on the ancient creation myth represented by Rahab, a monster who dwells in the waters and that was just quoted by Jacob in Isaiah? Does Jacob repurpose the myth of God destroying Rahab in cosmic battle to God destroying the monster death and hell through the atonement? Does Jacob signal this is what he is doing by using the term monster 
to describe death and hell when nobody else in the Book of Mormon does that? Does Jacob signal this further by locating the monster in or near a lake, a body of water, a lake of fire and brimstone? And finally, does Jacob signal this by mentioning the monster three times, a symbolically significant number? In conclusion, the Isaiah chapters quoted by Jacob are not just filler material, but relate to the restoration of the Jews. Two, Jacob embroiders this restoration theme to apply not only to the Jews after the Babylonian captivity returning to Jerusalem, but also to the Jews after the diaspora in the last days, to his own posterity, to the restoration of the spirit to the body, and the restoration of ourselves to God on the day of judgment. And three, Jacob incorporates not only themes, but phrases from Isaiah in his sermon, up to and including an apparent allusion to Rahab, the monster of the primordial deep, now personified as death and hell, the devil, and a lake of fire and brimstone. All right. Well, that is about all we have for tonight. I'm going to go to, there we go. Now I can see myself again. Thanks so much for joining us. I thought this was a very, very fascinating examination of the Sermon of Jacob in 2 Nephi chapter 6 through 10. As I look closer at the Book of Mormon, and as I exercise my brain in trying to understand it, I find that there is complexity there and thematic material and intentionality in the sermon that I would not have discovered by just reading it at the surface level. And I hope that through going through this lesson and this exercise, you have come to the same conclusion. Or maybe you'll just conclude that it's all just a coincidence. At any rate, this has been Radio Free Mormon Sunday School. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, and please leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. Thank you so much for joining me. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon Sunday School. Signing off the air.